Maybe the most incredible compliment that somebody could give you in your preaching and teaching ministry is that you are authentically you. Whether you are on a stage or behind a pulpit or behind the scenes as just a regular person. Authenticity, it's the mark of a truly remarkable preacher and teacher. Welcome back to Powerful Preaching. Today is episode number two, and we're going to dive into a scriptural principle that every preacher and every teacher needs to take the time to consider. And I know that it is going to encourage you and empower you as we do a little bit of educating you today as well. Uh, A phenomenal father of the faith gone by by the name of Martin Lloyd-Jones penned this phrase, preaching is truth coming through a man on fire. Preaching is truth coming through a man on fire. And a dear friend of mine and preaching hero said this in a book he wrote on preaching, that your preaching reflects who you are, or at least it ought to. So, do you have a chapter and verse for that? Absolutely. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, and kind of break it apart as we see what God has to say about this ministry. Are you ready? Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Uh, The end of that verse, this is all in the sight of God, is the most important part of it all. But let's go back to the beginning and take a look at a few principles we need to understand before we ever get to the outline, before we ever get to all of the practical things of a better delivery and powerful preparation. You need to understand and become fully comfortable with the authenticity that is required for a powerful preacher of the gospel. We have this ministry, and I know that there are many implications and there's a whole lot of context around this 2 Corinthians chapter 4 passage, but could I speak to you for a moment and say, you've been given this ministry of communicating the word of God in such a way that people can hear it, understand it, dissect it, study it, appreciate it, and ultimately apply it all to the glory of God. You've been given this ministry as you've received mercy. What a incredible reality. What a beautiful truth to lean into that ministers need mercy. There's no way that we could be ministering in the capacity that we are if we had not received and if we are not celebrating the wonderful mercy of our master. And so because of that, because we have this ministry and because we received mercy, look at this, we do not lose heart. We don't lose heart. There's no need and really no time for discouragement and downtroddenness and worry and anxiety and fear in the life of a powerful preacher of God's word. There's no time for it because you've received mercy and because you've been gifted with the great privilege of this ministry. We don't lose heart. We can't. We can't lose heart. Our congregations are watching us. And Lord willing, like Paul, we can say, follow me as I follow Christ. We want to give them something to emulate, a a person to look to and see how the gospel is modeled in our life. And so as ministers, um, no time to waste being of downcast mind. I like to say it this way, disappointments are inevitable. They, they truly are. Disappointments are inevitable from traffic to meetings that you have to life situations to whatever may be coming your way. You are going to be disappointed, mark it down. But discouragement is a choice. Discouragement is an attitude of defeat that works against a life that is filled with faith by and from the Holy Spirit. Disappointments are inevitable, but discouragement is a choice. And since we have this ministry, as we received mercy, we do not lose heart. But watch this. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame. Hmm. We're living in a time where so many pastors are falling. Big church pastors, small church pastors, and everything in between. 
And could I just be your friend right now that looks you in the eye to say, renounce the hidden things of shame. We, we cast off the shame that sin attempts to burden us with. We leave that in the past, but could we zero in on renouncing the hidden things of shame, the shameful things that you wouldn't want anybody ever to know? What if today you determined to renounce them? That's a reject. It's a put something in its place. It's a repent. It's a move forward. It's a get accountability and renounce it like I'm never going back to that thing and I'm making this statement and I'm making this action. It's like renouncing your citizenship to a country or renouncing renouncing your belonging to a particular organization. In the political sphere, uh, people are often asked to renounce things that they may have been aligned with in the past. And as a minister, might we renounce the hidden things? Because the promise of scripture is that which is in darkness will be brought to light. So dear friend, because we have this ministry and because we've received mercy, we don't lose heart. Instead, we renounce the hidden things of shame. May we see a generation where not another pastor falls because of the hidden things that they keep hidden. Get some accountability, get some counseling, get some help, and get real about the things that you struggle with because the only, the only, do you, do you hear me? The only sin that has power over you and in your life are the secret ones the ones that you refuse to surface and bring to light. We renounce the hidden things of shame. Look at verse number two, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God. I think we could probably spend hours, <laughs> probably weeks on end, talking about craftiness and adulterating the word of God. But one of the ways that we do adulterate the word of God and adulterate the ministry is we attempt to lean into craftiness in preaching rather than into anointing and study and our own personality in preaching. Know this, God created you with a particular personality in order to reach a particular city particular people and to serve him in a particular way. And so you need not feel the burden of trying to emulate someone else's style. Friend, I would submit to you that that is craftiness in preaching that God is not with you in. I can think of years where I was watching one particular preacher. So I decided to, I decided to shout like he did and emphasize points the way he did. And I uh, preached more like him than I did like me. And then I went through a year or two where I listened to a particular communicator that was more conversational in their style and often would notably sit down on a stool. And uh, they didn't preach a sermon. They had a talk with the community. And there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is it's not me. And it took time. It, it took lots of time to figure out what's my style and what's my voice. But for as often as I was trying to copy someone else's craft, I was crafty in my preaching. Um, we also become crafty in our preaching, uh, and again, not in a positive way. Preaching is a craft that we should work on and grow in, but we become negative connotation, crafty in our preaching when we work more on alliteration than we do on application. And I'm sorry that that was alliterated right there. It wasn't intentional. When we work more on the cleverness of our points than on the clarity of the message as is written and recorded in Scripture. We're so busy trying to be cool and crafty that we have forsaken the effectiveness of preaching the Word of God and letting the Holy Spirit do what only the Holy Spirit can do. When a passage lends toward a clever statement, by all means, lean into it. When there's an appropriate story to be added in, uh, wonderful, make it happen. Um, when there is an illustration, uh, maybe an object lesson, uh, Jesus preached with parables, what a wonderful, wonderful thing to apply. But if you're working on making your sermon points all tweetable and all t-shirt wearable, if the focus becomes on merch rather than helping people understand and grapple with the depth of the scriptures, you've become a crafty preacher and God is not with you in that. 
uh, stop trying to be someone else and recognize that that it, if if your style <laughs> lends more <laughs> toward a, a breathy <laughs> and a and a repetitive ha <laughs> and a old school then then by all means if that's you if it's really you lean into it L- lean into it if you're more of a if you're a preacher who gets powerful then a- amen praise the lord if you're more of a conversationalist a narrative driven communicator that can draw people in and really captivate them in more of a conversational tone by all means lean into it but here's the thing we all go to our favorite restaurants because we expect the food to be predictable you know, I took my wife last year for our anniversary to my favorite steakhouse. I eat at it maybe once a year. It's called Ruth's Chris. And it was a wonderful meal. I think they do steak and lobster better than anybody else. I love the flavor of their steak. It's fantastic. It's glorious. It's heaven come down and glory filled my soul level good. My wife, though, a little indifferent. And uh, what a beautiful thing for the budget that... Uh, Ruth's Chris didn't really speak to her as much as a good steak from Texas Roadhouse. She loves a steak from Texas Roadhouse. Something about the way they prepare their steak really ministers to her taste buds. So we gather up the family and we take everyone to Texas Roadhouse and my mother-in-law lets us know this is good, but I really prefer the steak at Longhorn uh, Steakhouse better than at Texas Roadhouse. And so uh, (laughs) a couple weeks later, we load everyone up and we go to Longhorn and it was good. And my father-in-law is like, yeah, yeah, this is good. But man, I I really like the steak at Outback Steakhouse. And here we are four people all eating the same ingredients. I mean, dead cow is the core ingredient in all of this. But something about the preparation and the seasoning made all the difference for all four of us that we like steak, but I want steak at a different place than they want steak. Now I can go to any steakhouse and enjoy it. But I go back to my favorite spot because it's my favorite flavor. I don't know if you're getting what I'm uh, bringing to you yet, but let me just say, you're going to reach particular people with your style. And if every week you're trying to copy someone else's style, it's almost like... um, preaching whiplash for the congregation as they're coming to listen. Some people are not going to like your style, and you need to be okay with that. They're going to be ministered to better by that guy and his way of communicating, and that's okay. As long as we're all preparing steak, God is glorified. Paul leaned into this, and he said, some people are preaching out of spite, and some people are preaching because they love the Lord, and I'm just here celebrating that the gospel's being preached. That's okay. But here's the thing. Find your flavor. Find your seasoning. Are you baking it or are you grilling it? How are you serving it up and with what sides? Really matters little. What matters is that it's your recipe, it's God's ingredients, and you're bringing it faithfully, hot and fresh to the congregation with your personality. The ambiance at Texas Roadhouse is way different than Longhorn, but at the end of the day, everybody's getting fed, and that's what matters. Find your flavor and stick with it. Grow in your craft, but don't be crafty in your preaching. The scripture goes on, we're not adulterating the word of God. I think we've leaned into that already, but preach the scripture in its context. The Bible only means one thing. And so there are many applications, but only one interpretation. And how can you know unless you study? More on that in coming episodes on not adulterating the word of God. But let me just say this. There are some people who are adulterating the word of God because they're utilizing their sermons um, really just for content. Now, there is absolutely nothing wrong with social media content. Here I am preparing something for you that you're consuming in a digital way. It's a great blessing and a great ministry in the day and age in which we live. But there are some, in fact, I just came across a preacher a few weeks ago who was talking to me and asking my advice. And he said, Pastor John, I'm thinking about uh, taking another church and becoming a pastor again. I said, okay, tell me about that. He said, yeah, I just really think it would be good for my content. 
It could just be a content generator for me. That's all it really is. It's, it wasn't about the people for him. It wasn't about the community reaching the city, seeing souls saved. It was about adulterating the word of God for his own benefit on social media. There are so many other directions we could go with that, but here's the thing. If no one outside of your congregation ever sees your sermon on social media, you've lost nothing. Your job is to be a faithful student of the word of God. Don't adulterate the word. But watch this. By the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. God knows who you are. He designed your personality with specificity and beauty. It's unique. And while our styles may be different, our Savior is the same. The greatest compliment that anyone could ever give you is that you are the same on the platform as you are off the platform. What a beautiful reality. When you step behind that pulpit or you grab that microphone with Bible in hand, be uniquely you. The preachers who feel compelled to step behind the pulpit and automatically switch uh, into a preacher voice uh, are doing absolutely nothing to serve the, the kingdom of God. It's not helpful. It's a put on. It's a show. And while it may emotionally energize some people uh, to hear that, listen, if you're not a screamer, don't scream behind the pulpit. And if you are more of an enthusiastic, point-driven, let me get this across, that's me, um, the conversational talks are probably not going to be on the menu of the congregation that I'm serving. Be uniquely you. Be who you are in the pulpit. You don't need to try and be larger than life. You don't need to try and be this personality. Listen, if you're an introvert, be an introvert. If you're an extrovert, be an extrovert. What I'm getting at is if you want to be a biblical, powerful preacher, you need to be you because God has designed you, suited you, and equipped you to preach the message he wants you to preach to the people he wants you to reach. Now, I want to encourage you to do everything you can to grow in your craft in your skill as a communicator. Anything that may cloud your message, distract from your message, hinder your message, or make it confusing, may we learn over the coming weeks together how to eliminate all of those things in order to communicate with clarity the wonderful words of life. Grow in your craft, but keep it authentic. As I quoted before, Martin Lord Lloyd Jones said, preaching is truth coming through a man on fire. If you will light yourself on fire, I believe it was Charles Wesley said that people will come from miles around to watch you burn. Your preaching, your delivery, your teaching, your communication is a reflection of who you are and who God made you to be. Never forget that. Your preaching, well, it needs to be uniquely and specifically you. Thanks for being here for episode two, and I can't wait to see you next month. If you know somebody who could benefit from these teachings, be sure to share them with them and let me know. I'd love to connect them with a discount code where they could watch a couple of these classes absolutely free. I'll see you on our Zoom calls very, very soon.